Hi, I'm Marty Nemco. Those of you who are followers of this uh, YouTube channel know that I mainly offer how-to advice and occasionally uh, intersperse me playing the, the piano, old show tunes and the like, and more recently have been uh, reading aloud some essays written by other people that I think are worth your time. Well, today's is called The Moral Instinct by Steven Pinker, a Harvard professor, and this appeared in the New York Times. Uh, this is, it's a long essay, so I've, I've cut it down to, I'm guessing, about 13 minutes, but I do think it's worth your time. <clears throat> and with, with all media these days, if you don't feel that way, you can always uh, switch to something else. Which of the following people would you say is the most admirable? Mother Teresa, Bill Gates, or Norman Borlaug? And which do you think is the least admirable? For most people, that's an easy question. Mother Teresa, famous for ministering to the poor in Calcutta, has been beatified by the Vatican, awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, and ranked in an American poll as the most admired person in the 20th century. Bill Gates, infamous for giving us the Microsoft dancing paperclip and the blue screen of death, has been decapitated in effigy in I Hate Gates websites and hit literally with a pie in the face. As for Norman Borlaug, well, who the heck is Norman Borlaug? Yet a deeper look might lead you to rethink your answers. Borlaug, father of the Green Revolution that used agricultural science to reduce world hunger, has been credited with saving a billion lives, more than anyone else in history. Those examples show that our heads can be turned by an aura of sanctity, distracting us from a more objective reckoning. Moralization is a psychological state that can be turned on and off like a switch, and when it's on, a distinctive mindset commandeers our thinking. This is the mindset that makes us deem actions immoral. Killing is wrong, rather than merely disagreeable, such as I hate Brussels sprouts, unfashionable, like bell bottoms are out, or imprudent, don't scratch mosquito bites. We all know what it feels like when the moralization slips flips inside us, the righteous glow, the burning dudgeon, the drive to recruit others to the cause. Much of our recent social history, including the culture wars between liberals and conservatives, consists of the moralization or amoralization of particular kinds of behavior. Until recently, it was understood that some people didn't enjoy smoking or avoided it because it was hazardous to their health. But with the discovery of the harmful effects of secondhand smoke, smoking is now treated as immoral. Smokers are ostracized. Images of people smoking are censored. Entities touched by smoke are felt to be contaminated. So hotels have not only non-smoking rooms, but non-smoking floors. The desire for retribution has been visited on tobacco companies who have been slapped with staggering punitive damages. At the same time, many behaviors have been amoralized, switched from moral failings to lifestyle choices. They include divorce, illegitimacy, being a working mother, marijuana use, and homosexuality. Many afflictions have been reassigned from payback for bad choices to unlucky misfortunes, there used to be people called bums and tramps. Today they are homeless. Drug addiction is a disease. Syphilis was rebranded from the price of wanton behavior to a sexually transmitted disease, and more recently, sexually transmitted infection. Dozens of things that past generations treated as practical matters are now ethical battlegrounds, including disposable diapers, IQ tests, poultry farms, Barbie dolls, and research on breast cancer. Food alone has become a minefield, with critics sermonizing about the size of sodas, the chemistry of fat, the freedom of chickens, the price of coffee beans, the species of fish, and now the distance the food has traveled from farm to plate. Whether an activity flips our mental switches to the moral setting isn't just a matter of how much harm. We don't show contempt to the man who fails to change the batteries in his smoke alarms or takes his family on a driving vacation both of which multiply the risk they'll die in an accident. Driving a gas-guzzling Hummer is reprehensible, but driving gas-guzzling old Volvo is not. Eating a Big Mac is unconscionable, but not imported cheese or creme brulee. The reason for these double standards is obvious. People tend to align their moralization with their own lifestyles. The gap between people's convictions and their justifications is on display in the favorite new sandbox for moral psychologists, a thought experiment devised by the philosophers Philippa Foote and Judith Jarvis Thompson called the trolley problem. On your morning walk, you see a trolley car hurtling down the track. 
The conductor slumped over the controls. In the path of the trolley are five men working on the track, oblivious to the danger. You're standing at a fork in the track and can pull a lever that will divert the trolley onto a spur, saving the five men. Unfortunately, the trolley would then run over a single worker who is laboring on the spur. Is it permissible to throw the switch, killing one man to save five? Almost everyone says yes. Consider now, though, a different scene. You're on a bridge overlooking the tracks and have spotted the runaway trolley bearing down on the five workers. Now the only way to stop the trolley is to throw a heavy object in its path, and the only heavy object within reach is a fat man standing next to you, should you throw the man off the bridge. Both dilemmas present you with the option of sacrificing one life to save five, and so by the utilitarian standard of what would result to the greatest good in the greatest good for the greatest number, the two dilemmas are morally equivalent, but most people don't see it that way. Though they would pull the switch in the first dilemma, they would not heave the fat man in the second. When pressed for a reason, they can't come up with anything coherent, though moral philosophers haven't had an easy time coming up with a relevant difference either. Joshua Green, a philosopher and cognitive neuroscientist, suggests that evolution equipped people with a revulsion to manhandling an innocent person. This instinct, he suggests, tends to overwhelm any utilitarian calculus that would tote up their lives saved and lost. The impulse against roughing up a fellow human would explain other examples in which people abjure killing one to save many, like euthanizing a hospital patient to harvest his organs and save five dying patients in need of transplants, or throwing someone out of a crowded lifeboat to keep it afloat. When people are pondering a hands-off dilemma like switching the trolley onto the spur with a single worker, the brain reacted differently. Only the area involved in rational calculation stood out. Other studies have shown that neurological patients who have blunted emotions because of damage to the frontal lobes become utilitarians. They think that it makes perfect sense to throw the fat man off the bridge. Together, the findings corroborate Green's theory that our non-utilitarian intuitions come from the victory of an emotional impulse over a cost-benefit analysis. The idea that the moral sense is an innate part of human nature is not far-fetched. The stirrings of morality emerge early in childhood. Toddlers spontaneously offer toys and help to others and try to comfort people they see in distress. And according to psychologists Elliot Turiel and Judith Smetana, preschoolers have an inkling of the differences between societal conventions and moral principles. Four-year-olds say that it is not okay to wear pajamas to school, that's a convention, and also not okay to hit a little girl for no reason, that's a moral um, principle. But when asked whether these actions would be okay if the teacher allowed them, most of the kids said that wearing pajamas would now be fine, but that hitting a little girl would still not be. Though no one has identified genes for morality, there is circumstantial evidence that they exist. The character traits called conscientiousness and agreeableness are far more correlated in identical twins separated at birth, who share their genes but not their environment, than in adoptive siblings raised together, who share their environment but not their genes. People given diagnoses of antisocial personality disorder or psychopathology show signs of morality blindness from the time they're kids. They bully younger children, torture animals, habitually lie, and seem incapable of empathy or remorse, often despite fairly normal or fully normal um, family backgrounds. Some of these children grow up into the monsters who bilk elderly people out of their savings, rape a succession of women, or choose, shoot convenience store clerks lying on the floor during a robbery. In a large web survey, psychologist Jonathan Haidt found that liberals put a lopsided moral weight on harm and fairness while playing down group loyalty, authority, and purity. Conservatives, instead, place a moderately high weight on all five. It's not surprising that each side thinks it's driven by lofty ethical values and that the other side is base and unprincipled. The meme of the selfish gene escaped from popular biology books and mutated into the idea that organisms, including people, are ruthlessly self-serving. And this doesn't follow. When a mother stays up all night comforting a sick child, the genes that endowed her with that tenderness were selfish in a metaphorical sense, but by no stretch is she really being selfish. Nor does reciprocal altruism, the evolutionary rationale behind fairness, imply that people do no good deeds in the cynical expectation of repayment down the line. We all know of unrequited good deeds, like tipping a waitress in a city you will never visit again and falling on a grenade to save platoon mates. Of course, a theory that predicted that everyone always sacrificed themselves for another's good would be as preposterous as a theory that predicted that no one ever did. Alongside the niches for saints, there are niches for more grudging reciprocators 
who attract fewer and poorer partners but don't make the sacrifices necessary for a sterling reputation, and both may coexist with outright cheaters who exploit, exploit the unwary in one-shot encounters. Morals certainly aren't in the physical world, like wavelength or mass, but perhaps we are born with a rudimentary moral sense, and as soon as we build on it with moral reasoning, the nature of moral reality forces us to some conclusions but not others. Not coincidentally, the interchangeability of perspectives keeps reappearing in history's best thought through moral philosophies, including the Golden Rule, itself discovered many times, Spinoza's viewpoint of eternity, the social contract of Hobbes, Rousseau, and Locke, Kant's categorical imperative, and Rawls's veil of ignorance. It also underlies Peter Singer's theory of the expanding circle, the optimistic proposal that our moral sense, though shaped by evolution to overvalue self, kin, and clan, can propel us on a path of moral progress as our reasoning forces us to generalize it to a larger and larger circle of sentient beings. At the very least, the science tells us that even when our adversary's agenda is most baffling, they may not be amoral psychopaths, but in the throes of a moral mindset that appears to them to be every bit as mandatory and universal as ours does to us. Of course, some adversaries really are psychopaths, and others are so poisoned by a punitive moralization that they're beyond the pale of reason. The actor Will Smith had many historians on his side when he recently speculated to the press that Hitler thought he was acting morally. But in any conflict in which the meeting of the minds is not completely hopeless, a recognition that the other guy is acting for moral rather than venal reasons can be a first patch of common ground. One side can acknowledge the other's concern for community or stability or fairness or dignity, even while arguing that some other value should trump it in that instinct. With affirmative action, for example, the opponents can be seen as arguing from a sense of fairness, not racism, and the defenders can be seen as acting from a concern with community, not bureaucratic power. Liberals can ratify conservatives' concern with families, while noting that gay marriage is perfectly consistent with that concern. Though wise people have long reflected on how we can be blinded by our own sanctimony, our public discourse still fails to discount it appropriately. In the worst cases, the thoughtlessness of our brute intuitions can be celebrated as a virtue. In his influential essay, The Wisdom of Repugnance, Leon Cass, former chair of the President's Council on Bioethics, argued that we should disregard reason when it comes to cloning and other biomedical technologies and go with our gut. He said, quote, we are repelled by the prospect of cloning human beings because we intuit and feel immediately and without argument the violation of things that we rightfully hold dear. In this age in which everything is held to be permissible so long as it's freely done, repugnance may be the only voice left that speaks up to defend the central core of our humanity. Shallow are the souls that have forgotten how to shudder, end quote. There are, of course, good reasons to regulate human cloning, but the shudder test is not one of them. People have shuddered at all kinds of morally irrelevant violations of purity in their culture, touching an untouchable, drinking from the same water fountain as a Negro, allowing Jewish blood to mix with Aryan blood, tolerating sodomy between consenting men. And if our ancestors' repugnance had carried the day, we never would have had autopsies, vaccinations, blood transfusions, artificial insemination, organ transplants, and in vitro fertilization, all of which were denounced as immoral when they were new. Nowhere is moralization more of a hazard than in our greatest global challenge. The threat of human-induced climate change has become the occasion for moralistic revival meeting. In many discussions, the cause of climate change is overindulgence, too many SUVs, and defilement, sullying the atmosphere. And the solution is temperance, that's conservation, and expiation, buying carbon offset coupons. Yet the experts agree that these numbers don't add up. Even if every last American became conscientious about his or her carbon emissions, the effects on climate change would be trifling, if for no other reason that the two billion Indians and Chinese are unlikely to copy our born-again esteemiousness. Though voluntary conservation may be one wedge in an effective carbon reduction pie, the other wedges will have to be morally boring, like a carbon tax and new energy technologies, or even taboo ones like nuclear power or the deliberate manipulation of the ocean and atmosphere. Our habit of moralizing problems, merging them with intuitions of purity and contamination, and resting content when we feel the right feelings, can get in the way of doing the right thing. Far from debunking morality, then, the science of the moral sense can advance it by allowing us to see through the illusions that evolution and culture have saddled us with and to focus on goals we can share and defend. As Anton Chekhov wrote, man will become better when you show him what he is like. In any event, I do thank you for watching. Uh, I'm Marty Nemco. I welcome your thumbs up and accept your thumbs down. 
I always look forward to your comments and especially like it if you hit the share button below. Share on your social media so that my efforts can have broader impact. And I am flattered if you choose to subscribe to my channel. In any event, I do thank you for watching. I am Marty Nemko.